Wish Dragon is is such a beautiful story of friendship and redemption, and uh, it it was just kind of a dream project as a composer to be involved with. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Pop Culture Planet. I'm your host, Kristen Maldonado, and today we are speaking with Philip Klein, the composer of Netflix's Wish Dragon. These scores really just bring the stories to life. For you, for, for Wish Dragon, could you tell us a little bit about the film and what made you want to be a part of it and compose the the, the score for this? And it's a beautiful story. I think, uh, you know, on surface level, there's certainly parallels to the, the you know, the genie in a bottle, three wish kind of thing. I, I it, it's in, in, in some of that in, in respects, it's because of the trailers and, you know, there's only so much they can give away in a trailer. Um, but it, the film is so much more deep, deeper than that. And it, it's actually not really about the three wishes um, by the end of the film. And, and I think that Chris, the director from, from really early on, w just seemed like he was such an honest filmmaker. I mean, this is his first feature film on his own. And, and, uh, I just really wanted to be a part of it. I love animation. I think there's there's an escapism to to animation that I love because I mean, who doesn't want to grow up? You know, I mean, it's just like we all kind of want to remain children at, at some point. That kind of like blissful ignorance of being young, and and I think um, I love escaping to that world on a, on a regular basis as a composer. And and I I think Wish Dragon is is such a beautiful story of friendship and redemption and. Uh, it, it was just kind of a dream project as a composer to be involved with because you got to really tap into some really nice emotional material. And uh, um, so, so often I think animation is, is about comedy or, or um, wistfulness and stuff like that. And, and I think this one really had a story at its heart that, that was just, it just spoke to me. And so I was, I was very keen early on to kind of be involved and, you know, wrote a bunch of demos and then crossed my fingers and thankfully they liked them. So, <laughs> um, you know, here we are. And now, you know, this film is set in Shanghai. So how do you bring that kind of energy um, and that culture into the music that you're composing? Yeah, it was tricky. I mean, we, we never really set out to make a Chinese score. We wanted the score and we wanted the film to feel timeless and, and, and universal in its message. So, um, but at the same time, we certainly didn't want to completely ignore that, that cultural aspect um, since it's such a huge part of the film. And, and so Chris and I, you know, for the first three to six months of me being involved on this film, we're, we're just sending YouTube videos back and forth about this sounds amazing. This sounds cool. And I mean, everything from Chinese folk music being played by instruments we had never heard of to, you know, theatrical percussion pieces and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and we kind of honed in on, you know, maybe that's not the right way to go from a traditional standpoint, but what if we use those instruments as, as part of a fabric? So I started collecting instruments that I had no idea how to play and, and doing them a complete disservice. Um, but I, um, I just would, would beat them up or, or have a, an actual player have a Skype or a Zoom interview with me and, and, and I would let them play for me and see what it was capable of doing. And then, you know, ask them really embarrassing questions about, can it do this? And they would kindly just say no. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we would get to the point where, where we had this whole palette of instruments that, you know, I mean, are, are from that area, the pipa, the guching, all, all these really beautiful, amazing instruments. And we started manipulating them into like rhythmic textures. So Shanghai, that whole sequence in the beginning of the movie is, is just, tons and tons of layers of those instruments but it, they sound more modernized because we kind of put them through these processes that kind of made them a little more up to date with where we are in the movie at that point and then and then for the sequences that are more about the history of like long story the, the wish dragon um we let them maybe come a little more traditionally up you know rather than letting them sit back down. So I think there was a balance between when we're in the old story, the old world, we let the traditional things come up as they are. And then when we're more in the modern world, we, we kind of mix them down into the fabric a little more. So they're always there. It's just where they sit in relation to the, the Western kind of orchestra is, uh, is what changes as we shift through the movie. I would love to hear like, if there's like a certain scene maybe that you could kind of talk us through like, 
how did this come together? How did the sounds come together for this? A lot of the, the initial conversations with the director about like sonically where we want this to live or, or you know, how, how can we distinguish this? And I think that when I sit down in front of a scene for the first time on a movie, it's it's a lot of messing up. I think that's part of what we do. It's a lot of failures. It's a lot of, well, throwing as much as we can at the picture and then maybe pulling things away once we feel like we found the right vibe. But there's, I mean, there's, there's some really interesting sequences. There, there's, there's one in particular um, when Din, the main character, uh, he, you, you find out early on that the only way he can still connect with, with his, his childhood friend is by seeing her on a billboard. And it's, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful scene. It's, it's very sweet and, and wistful. And, and there's this whole sequence when he, he's like waiting for his mom to fall asleep so that he can, he can sneak out and go, go pretend like he's having dinner with her on the roof, you know? And, and um, there's this energy to him as he's like excited under his sheets and then the sheets bust off and he runs and, and so there's, it's a bubbling scene. There's, there's energy and, and you want this kind of feeling of like hopefulness and, and, and not, I don't want to say hopefully, or hopelessly romantic, but but it, you know there's a romance element to it, but it's also kind of just like Din being Din and being happy and just so excited to go see his friend and and I think we we initially had kind of more more orchestral things for that moment, and I said, but we're running on rooftops of Shanghai, you know. I mean, what happens if we really kind of dive into to bring more of those traditional instruments up for this sequence because we're in the Shukamins, which is the old old world traditional neighborhood of Shanghai. And, and, um, and so, you know, it started with like our rhythms and then, and then we started layering these things on top of it. And, and, and it, it just ended up being a sequence that I, I think has so much youthful energy for that moment. And, and I, I've always just thought it was, it was just a really nice vibe. You know, it just, it just feels like you're kind of floating on, he's bouncing all over these, these um, rooftops and, and, and it just felt like we, we found a right, just the right tempo to kind of like give him that little lift as he's running. And, and, but, you know, the compositional part of that, that process is, is it's just trial and error, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's bringing in sounds and saying, yeah, I don't think that's quite right. Or, or, or you bring something in and it, and it suddenly makes the scene come to life, you know, and, and for that one, what made that scene come to life were the traditional instruments that we had been using. So, the orchestra really plays kind of a down role in that scene. And we let the others kind of bring us up and, and infuse it with all that energy. So it was, it was a lot of fun, that scene. I mean, there's so many beautiful scenes in that movie that, you know, we could talk for an hour just about scenes. That's awesome. And, it, you know, you've worked on so many interesting projects. Most recently, Ryan the Last Dragon, The Mandalorian, upcoming Jungle Cruise, um, and also a wide range of like movies, TV shows, video games. Is there a difference in composing for, you know, these different forms of media? Well, yeah. I mean, every project is a new adventure for sure. I, I, I think Wish Dragon for me was a chance to dive into a culture that I didn't necessarily get to work with on a regular basis. So it was very exciting from a learning standpoint, which I think is so much of what a creative artist should always try to be doing is just continuing to grow and learn. And And I think um, that was the, the, the best part of this project. I mean, aside from working with amazing filmmakers, I, I think um, every project you kind of take from take from them something, you know, something. And I, whether it's a challenging project or it's a, or, or it's an amazing project or it's a, a difficult project or it's an easy project. I think I, you know, certainly I think TV is more instinctual because you have such less time to work on it. So you really have to trust your instincts. Whereas on Wish Dragon, we had, we had, I worked on it over a year. So we had time to really let our ideas you know, grow and mature. And, and if it wasn't working, start back at the beginning and try it again, you know, and, and you don't always get that kind of time. I mean, you almost never get that time with a TV show. Um, video games, I think are, are kind of a bridge between those two worlds. Um, they happen fast and they're fun, but they're also like very cinematic, you know, especially nowadays. I mean, video games have become just immersive experiences so so it's you know that that world is treated 
just as big as any film, major film project. So, um, yeah, I mean, everything is different. Every, everything brings a new challenge or, or a new world to, to learn. I, I, I think my, my biggest enjoyment out of all that stuff is that you get to really dig into some, I, I always try to find kind of, I'm working on a medieval film right now. So I just got to learn all about instruments in medieval times, you know, and, and, and for something like Wish Dragon, it was obviously the Chinese elements. And, and I worked on another movie that was more folky. So I got to learn more about like the first instruments of America, you know, like early folk instruments and stuff. And I think that's the most exciting part to me. And that's what gets my kind of creative brain going into hyperdrive is just like, the possibility of all this new sound that I've never really gotten to work with and, and what's capable with that. So um, I, I think that's universal across the board of media, but, but I think um, the biggest change is, is, is kind of the time maybe that you have on each one of those things. From all the projects you've worked on, are there any ones that, you know, maybe like certain scenes really stand out to you in the music that you've composed or worked on or, or anything that you're just like, ah, like when you think back on it, you're like, this was, this was the best. I worked on a film called Captain Fantastic um, with Viggo Mortensen. It was, it's a beautiful movie if you've never seen it. Um, but there's a scene at the end of the film where I arranged uh, the song that the kids, the kids of the movie and Viggo sing for, um, a, a dying relative, a dead relative. And I don't want to give away too much of the movie because it's the like emotion, most emotional scene, I think. But but there's this beautiful, It was. I got to be there when they were shooting because I was helping the, the, the actors be in sync and all this kind of stuff and just organizing and, and helping them figure out how to shoot and all that. And, and, and it just, in the movie, it's an absolutely gorgeous scene and it, it it's, highly emotional and it's just it's one of those scenes that are are you know it's it's just like a pinch me kind of moment like i i don't know how i got to this moment but it's it was it was just so much fun and, and deeply gratifying and um that's definitely one that sticks out in my brain i mean there are moments in wish dragon i think are are you know we we all did our jobs really well and it came together i think that that's ultimately what if, if something's working for me it's because i i mean i'm essentially the the you know, the, the cake froster at the end of the project. I come in and, and put some lovely designs on the film, but the film's already baked, you know? I'm there to make it, I'm there to make it kind of like pop in, in a way emotionally and, and dramatically, but you know, the, the base of it's all done. So um, without that stuff being great, I'm, you know, I'm just putting lipstick on a pig in, in a sense. <laughs> yeah. So like, I, uh, I, I um I defer always to 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 the film and and so you know if it's working it's it's honestly mostly because of the filmmakers I'm I'm just kind of riding that wave at the end of the process but I um yeah there, there's there's a lot but I do love I do I do love that moment in in Captain Fantastic I think it's gorgeous and and um I worked on a film called Last Full Measure that has a lot of really beautiful moments in it and heartfelt moments. I tend to always kind of like default to the, the heartfelt moments, I think, because I mean, I'm a composer, you know, I just deal with emotion. So <laughs> I say if I'm feeling something then I feel like I've done my job. And I'd love to just talk about, you know, how you got into music and composing as a whole. Like where did that kind of inspiration come from? I was around drum corps, which is a really, intense version of a marching band in the simplest terms um, from a young age. And so I had always heard really loud music. And then um, I, I think that the tipping point for me maybe in my life was uh, Jurassic Park. <laughs> I, um, I heard those glorious trumpets as the, as the helicopter was flying into the island. And that kind of uh, made my ears perk up a bit about what was possible with music. And um, and that kind of opened up all kinds of doors for me. And, and I was primarily a trumpet player for a long time. And then eventually I started writing music and I got much more into that. And um, that gradually kind of came full circle once I was in college and I just started doing films. Um, but uh, I, I would attribute really great teaching really good you know high school grade school teachers for kind of nurturing uh, the love of music in me from a young age um but i i had always been in love with film and in cinema and and 
and just the power that music could have in that world. And so I think it was pretty natural that I kind of started falling into that in college and doing short films and stuff like that. So it felt like a very uh, organic step to then move to LA and try to do it, you know, as a career 15 years ago now. So. Now, if there were people who are interested in getting into composing or, um, you know, trying to, to learn more about the field, what would you recommend for them? Any um, composing job, whether it's you want to be a concert composer or a film composer, or, you know, whatever. I think it's just about doing. And um, that's easier said than done when you're when you're younger, obviously. I, I, I think when you're young, you take advantage of um, that part of your life. And, and for instance, if you're in school, then find somebody who's making a movie, I guarantee someone is, or someone who's producing content or, or whatever, you know, you're, even if you're in high school, you can go to like your local radio stations or something like that and just say, Hey, I'm really interested in doing this. Could I give you guys some music just to try out, you know, and, 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 and you just kind of like start doing it. Um, the composition part is, is about, uh, it's a muscle and you just have to kind of you know, get into that that routine and try to write every day. But I think if you if you're serious about making it a career, then you know it's it's about meeting people and it's it's about asking questions. It's about finding a composer maybe that can take you under their wing, um, and it and it's just persistence and and patience. It's it's not a career I think that happens overnight, even though. Sometimes it may feel like that because you've never heard of a composer, then all of a sudden you've heard of them all the time, but you don't you don't see the the twenty years leading up to that moment, you know. So I think um, sometimes there's a, a misnomer that you can come out here and like be be a composer immediately. You kind of have to to kind of work your way up a bit with with learning and and getting comfortable with scoring films and and getting comfortable with the 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 psychology of working with people creatively and, and collaboratively that that can sometimes be challenging, but ultimately it's just about doing it and finding people that are making movies and reaching out to them and, and saying, this is what I want to do. Can I try to do it on your film? And, um, and then going from there, I, I think just keep always do your best work. That's, that's all I could say is no matter what size the project is, try to do your best work all the time because you never know who's going to hear it. So. I mean, Carter Burwell, one of the most famous, successful film composers who worked with the Coen brothers, was like in a band playing at like a bar and they heard him playing some original music and suddenly he was scoring Raising Arizona. So, I mean, wow. you know, you, you just don't know who's going to hear you. And I mean, not that every story is a discovery story, but I, but I do think like if you're putting music out into the world, you might as well have it sound good you know, and sound well constructed. So... Um, but yeah, it's it's persistence and just doing. You mentioned Jurassic Park is one of your favorite scores. I'd love to know why do you think that it resonates with people and what are some other scores that people should study if they want to get into composing? I can find something to love about pretty much every score um, because as a composer, I can appreciate how much work goes into even a score that might sound very simple is not. Uh, I think everything is is conscious decisions. I, I, I think in in Jurassic Park, not only is the music just brilliantly written and, and catchy and, and soaring and exhilarating, um, it also just ultimately it fits the film like a glove, which is what our job is to do. And, and I think that if you, if you approach a film thinking that you're gonna get to write great music that makes you happy, then maybe you're approaching it a little differently. I would study films where Maybe you don't even like the music, but they fit so perfectly well. I think Joker was a great score for that. It's it's not music that maybe you want to necessarily listen to a lot, but but when you when you watch it with the movie, it, it's just perfect. You know, it's perfect for that world. And I and I think that's that's a a good in indication of what your job is to do. Your job is to is to elevate the movie the best way you can. And um, I mean, there are, there are some classic scores that I think are, are just so great. I mean, Basic Instinct by Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, it's a hard movie to watch, but but it's it's a it's a brilliant score. I, I think some of the old Bernard Herrmann um, Psycho certainly sticks out as being one that, that that really kind of lives up to that what music could bring to a movie and. A lot of old Bernard Herrmann too. I, I find North by Northwest and Vertigo, I think are some of the greatest scores. And um, 
more recently, I mean, animation has some beautiful music too. I mean, Up was gorgeous. I think that's a great film to learn from musically. And um, Michael Giacchino is kind of a genius when it comes to animation. And, and um, yeah, I, there's no shortage of great music. <laughs> I think like um, Zimmer, Zimmer has written some really amazing things. I, I would, I would often tell young composers to seek out to seek out director director relationships with composers that have been really successful and kind of watch their work to see what makes it work so well. I mean, John Williams and Steven Spielberg, obviously, Alan Zemeckis and or Robert Zemeckis and Alan Silvestri are another one. They, you know, they did all the uh, Back to the Future and and Roger Rabbit and Forrest Gump and those are all brilliant scores, brilliant movies. Um, James Newton Howard and M. Night Shyamalan's uh, stuff is amazing. Signs by James Newton Howard is one of the greatest scores I think that's ever been written. Um, the Village is beautiful. I, I mean, it you know, there's there's no shortage. And now you have like Ludwig Göransson with with Ryan Kogler. I mean, there's there's some really exciting filmmaking happening. And I I think the best way to kind of to learn from that is to look at what they're doing together and why it's working so well. And that can be everything from like what you're actually seeing to also their creative approach, which is sometimes maybe harder to learn about. But nowadays, I feel like everybody's had at least a couple interviews about how their their creative approach is with their directors. So um, I, I think those are some of the, the best ones to study uh, from a from the standpoint of just learning about what what it is that film music can do and what it is that makes it so successful when it in his work. If you like this one, you can check out more Pop Culture Planet right over here, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.